Once again, we're in the book of Acts, been preaching verse by verse through the book of Acts. Last uh, Sunday night, we were in chapter 23, and I made a statement at the beginning of the service last Sunday night that this chapter is an easy read. It's a fun read. Well, chapter 24 is also an easy read and a fun read. Amen. Not all reading in the Bible is fun, and not all reading in the Bible is easy, but this chapter is fun and easy. Amen. Let's stand for the read of God's Word, the book of Acts, chapter 24. I'm going to read um, the first four verses. Now, just to bring you up to where we're at, uh, Paul has been taken to Caesarea. He was taken there by night, quickly, by the chief captain, Lysias, and an army went with Paul. It was an incredible move of God to get him out of Jerusalem, get him into Caesarea. And the chief captain, Lysias, left a beautiful letter for the governor, Felix, to read. And of course, uh, Governor Felix said, I'll listen to the case uh, when they took him into Herod's judgment hall there in verse 35 of chapter 23. Uh, the reason Herod's judgment, judgment hall was there in Caesarea is because Herod liked a beautiful spot in Caesarea down by the water. And he built him a nice little palace there and he had a judgment hall there, the reason uh, they went down to Caesarea. And, and Paul spent a long time in Caesarea before going uh, by ship toward Rome. And we'll see that as we progress into this chapter. But it is a beautiful um, manifestation of God's provision. Verse 1, after five days, Ananias, or Annas, this is the high priest, the same dirty scoundrel that brought judgment against Jesus. This high priest descended with the elders, and that word descended means like a bunch of flies on a carcass, descended down to uh, Caesarea, and they brought with them, it says, with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. The governor, of course, is Felix. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse Paul, saying, Seeing that by these, or by thee, we enjoy great quietness, he's bragging on Felix, and that uh, very worthy, your very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by the providence, by thy providence. We accept it always, and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness, notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. I want to use for a subject, Felix stands before Paul. It's not a misplay on words. It's not Paul stands before Felix, it's Felix stands before Paul. You may be seated. Felix is the governor. Felix was assigned uh, governorship of Judea by the Roman Emperor Claudius Caesar. His full name was Antonius Felix, governor of Judea or Judea Precinct Caesarea. And of course, the chief captain takes Paul down to Caesarea, as we read about how incredible it was. And so um, Felix said, I want to wait and hear from those in the Sanhedrin or in the Jewish court. And so they took him into uh, Herod's judgment hall and they held Paul captive. There he was arrested, basically. And the scripture says it took five days for Ananias, the high priest, to descend like a bunch of vultures with the elders. And they brought with them a lawyer by the name of Tertullius. Tertullius was a silver tongue. He was a great orator. He, he could speak with incredible ability. 
He was, the word totilis means third. It actually means third party. And anytime you have a third party involved, the facts never is correct. And Totilus was a, was a orator, a fancy lawyer, basically what they hired to go down and bring the case to Felix against Apostle Paul. And so I want to begin by saying Totilus was a manure spreader. Tertullus was a a manure spreader. Has anybody ever met a manure spreader? I understand there's a whole bunch of them in Washington, D.C. Manure spreaders. Tertullus was a manure spreader. You say, why do you say that? Because he bragged on uh, Felix and started telling how great Felix was by his divine providence, you know. And he he got to bragging on on, Felix. Antonius Felix. Now, I happen to know by historical facts that Felix was a dirty rat, and he had killed thousands of Jews through different, what he thought, insurrections, and he was a mass murderer, a butcherer, yet this Tertullus, this fancy lawyer, goes down there, and he spreads on the manure and says to Felix, you are We enjoy quietness. Yeah, right. We enjoy quietness. No, they had all kinds of scrimmages. But we enjoy quietness. We have peace because of you, um, Felix. And he went on to say, not only that, you're worthy. You have worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. Then he didn't say God's providence. He said thy providence. Providence. And we accept it always, and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Notwithstanding, I'm not going to further be tedious to you. I'm going to get on with the facts. And, of course, he didn't have the facts. He was just spreading manure. He was a smooth manure spreader. I mean, he he put it on so thick that you made it. You you, you just want to. I just have a, a desire to put on rubber boots right now. And get me a wide shovel. But well, this guy is putting it on. Now you better be careful listening to people that brag about you all the time and puts on that, you know, that smooth manure compost on you. You better be careful because it'll draw the flies of criticism every time. And, you know, there's something highly stinky when someone comes around trying to brag on you and, and lift you up with words. Now, I'm okay with someone saying, you know, I appreciate you and that's a good message, whatever. But, you know, you meet them people that you, you, they just make you, they just talk about how sweet and wonderful you are. And you, ah, ah, you know, manure spreaders. That's what Tertullus was. He was just a manure spreader. He, most lawyers are. Almost all, all politicians are, if not all of them are. And so they come to bring the case of Paul, uh, uh, bring a case against Paul to Felix. Felix is listening to the case. And then in verse 5 through 9, here comes the baloney. First he's a manure spreader, now he's giving out the baloney. Tertullus is a blown, he's given the baloney. Verse 5. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader, oh brother, of the sect of the Nazarenes. Everybody hated the Nazarenes. Who also had gone about to pro- profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged according to our law. We took him and we was going to take care of this guy. But this guy named Lysias, the chief captain in verse 7, came upon us and he treated us real bad with great violence. He took Paul away out of our hands. Oh, whine, whine, whine. And he commanded his accusers to come unto thee. This Lysias, this chief captain, said, you need to go see Felix. Now, if you remember, they had a 
pact they were going to kill Paul. They, we called them dagger men. And they were going to kill Paul. They had vowed to not eat or drink for four, uh, until Paul was dead. And as far as I know, they probably drank some water and ate because there's nothing worse than a dagger man, a murderer that's hungry. So I'm sure that they eat something. But if they didn't, they're dead now. Well, they're dead either way. I mean, we'd agree they're dead by now. Hello. <laughs> I'm full of so much wisdom and intelligence. They're dead by now. But Paul lived on. By the way, he still lives on. All we know about is them dagger guys. They were bad dudes. But Paul, incredible apostle. And it says, uh, he commanded us, the accusers, we that were accusing Paul to examine thyself. Um, may, may it take knowledge of all things, all these things. In other words, this Tertullus is telling Felix, we want you to examine these things and take knowledge of all these things wherever we accused him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. What did the Jews say? The, 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 the leaders, the elders, they said when Tertullus spread the manure, when Tertullus shared the baloney, they said, amen. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yeah. You know, I'm always reminded of the story about a baloney sandwich that was thrown out outside of an intersection. The car was driving up, and the guy would eat a piece of baloney sandwich, and he didn't eat the rest of it and just throwed it out. It was raining. I mean, it was pouring down rain. He throws that baloney sandwich, half-eaten baloney sandwich out, and drives off. And there was a bird up on the high line and saw that baloney sandwich all wet and droopy, and he was cold. That bird was just drenched, wet, and... He flew down there. He ate that bologna sandwich, that little bird did. And about the time he got through eating that bologna sandwich, he, the sun came out. Sun began to shine. The bird flew back up on the fence post and the high line and ruffled its feathers and began to sing. Because the sun was shining. Sing! And about that time, a big old chicken hawk swooped down, grabbed that little bird begin to fly off of that little bird, and that little bird says, just go to show you when you're full of baloney, keep your mouth shut. And this guy was full of baloney, and he needed to keep his mouth shut. And so in verse 10 through 22, here comes the truth. Paul's going to answer now this Tertullus accusation, this baloney. He's going to answer this baloney and this foolishness. And, and Paul begins to give the truth. And he says right from the start, these people have no proof of what they accuse me of. Look at verse 10 through 22. Then Paul, after the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, in other words, the governor motioned for Paul that he could speak, for as much as I know that thou hast been of uh, many a years a judge unto this nation. Notice, Paul didn't give him no baloney. Paul didn't spread no manure here. Paul just said, I know you've been in office for a long time. And then he goes on to say, uh, it's been, he, he said, for as much as thou, verse 10, for as much, the middle way, as thou been many years to judge in this nation, in other words, you've been in office quite a while, I do, I do the more, cheerfully answer for myself. In other words, Paul says, I'm glad to answer. I want to answer. I'm not afraid, not ashamed. I want to answer. How many of God's children ought to be joyfully to answer? Any critics? And because thou mayest understand, in other words, Felix, I want you to understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for worship. Paul is saying it was just 12 days ago. Twelve days ago, they tried to kill me. Twelve days ago, they brought these accusations against me. He said, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. I wasn't causing any trouble. Verse 13, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Paul said they can't prove what they're saying. They cannot prove what they're saying. Let me tell you, friends, God's people 
the Christian, the children of God, are to live a life in so purity to the Lord, walking in the Spirit, loving God, that when someone brings something sinful, critical against you, it ought to be said they can't prove that against you. And Paul said they can't prove this. But verse 14, but this I confess unto thee that after the way. Now, the way is the Christian movement. It was Jesus. That was the way, the living way. He said after that, after the way, which they call heresy. They call the way heresy. So worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow. You know, even, even these scoundrels allow a guy to be happy in the Lord. Even these liars allow people to have hope in God that there shall be a resurrection of the dead. He's speaking to Pharisees here now, both of the just and the unjust. Herein do I exercise myself, verse 16, to have always a conscience void um, of offense toward God and toward men. In other words, Paul says, my conscience is clear. I don't have any, any, any voice in the back of my mind saying, what about this? Paul says, no, my conscience is clear. I've lived in, in honesty toward God. Verse 17, now after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. Remember, Paul gathered up finances to take to the poor people in Jerusalem. And that's what he's referring to. Where, and that was the reason he went back to Jerusalem, to take money to help the poor Christian in Jerusalem. Verse 18, whereupon certain Jews from Asia, that's over in, in uh, where he was in, in, Asia, in the uh, Philippine, Philippine the Philippian area, Tess, that was for you. And, and uh, he was over there in that area, Caesarea, that area. Uh, and so um, Paul says, these people from Asia, Ephesus, found me uh, purified in the temple. In other words, they found me through a purification of a vow to the Lord, neither with multitude nor with tumult. In other words, he said, I was not causing any trouble. Who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me? He said, they ought to be here too if they've got something against me, but they, 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 don't, they don't have anything against me. See, Paul is presenting the truth. Tertullus, Tertullus was presenting a lie. He, he was presenting false accusations. Paul says, I come with the truth. And then he says in verse 21, except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. You say, what does it mean by this one voice? Remember when Paul said, I believe in the resurrection. And the Pharisees said, amen, this is a pretty good guy. And the Sadducees said, we don't believe in that. And they had a big riot and the chief captain rescued Paul. Now in verse 22, it says, and when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, that's the Jesus way, he deferred them. In other words, he sent them away and said, when Lysias, uh, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of the matter. In other words, when the uh, Lysias comes, the chief captain comes, I'll hear his story, and then I'll make a a judgment. So this is Paul giving the truth in verse 23. Um, well, I, I want to stop there because there's some things I want to say. Paul says they have no proof. And Paul says, um, I, I come bringing you the truth. And he says to Felix, you know the truth. You know more than what you're letting on. Because Felix was married to a Jewish girl. When I say girl, she was a young, uh, young lady, Dacilla. I think, the, I think you pronounce it Dacilla. We, we'll read that. Well, let's read that real quickly. Verse uh, 24. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife, Dracilla, what a name, which was a Jewish, which was Jewish, she sent for Paul and heard him concerning faith in Christ. So obviously, Drusilla had shared with 
Felix somewhat of the Christian faith. Now, who was Drusilla? Drusilla, according to historians, says that she was a very beautiful woman. She was young, she was beautiful, and she was the daughter of, of uh, Herod Agrippa. Felix was born a slave. The historians said that he was born a slave. He bought his way out of slavery. He ascended up the ladder, a political ladder, and he married this Drusilla, and that's how he got his position as governor of Judea. That's how he got it. Drusilla was beautiful. She was young, but she happened to be the third wife of Felix. All political move. Well, the good looks didn't hurt anything either, I guess. But notice that Paul, well, Felix just orders Paul to be, you know, house arrest, kind of. You know, Paul could go about his business, and, but he didn't go into the, you know, the lower chambers of the jail. He wasn't locked up in jail. He was just kind of house arrest. You know, he, he, he was under arrest, but he could have visitors and he could get around. And, you know, he, because Felix knew that there was more to the story than these guys were putting on. He knew that he knew that, that lawyer was a manure spreader. He knew that there was a bunch of baloney going on. He knew all that, but he was afraid to take a stand. Felix had enough information that he could have released Paul right then and there. But the reason he didn't release Paul right then and there was because he was afraid of the crowd. He was afraid of the Jewish leaders. He was afraid. He didn't want to stir up any problem. So he says to Paul, well, you just, you know, you're going to hang around here. We're going to make you hang around here. You're still under arrest, but we're, we're going to let you have freedom to come and go and have visitors and et cetera, et cetera. And said, I'll call you later on, and we'll get more information. Now, this is what, where it gets interesting. Paul refuses to pay for a bribe to get out of jail or to get free. He refuses to. Now, notice, now, now listen, Felix has done already got into an adulterous affair with Drusilla. And Felix calls and Drusilla calls Paul to come for a visit or an interview to talk to him. And so Paul is brought before Felix, in verse 25, let me read it to you. Verse uh, 24 says, And after certain days when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Verse 25, And as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time, for when I have a convenient season, when I have a convenient season. When I, you know, when it's convenient for me, I will call for thee. And then verse 26, he did call for him. He called for Paul over and over again. Verse 26, he hoped, Felix hoped also that some money should be been given him of Paul. Felix wanted some money. Now, I want you to see the setting here because this is a beautiful setting. Felix calls, Felix has the power to, to put to death Paul. Felix has the strength to lock him up forever. But Felix calls Paul in and talks to him with his wife, Drusilla. And Paul preaches to Felix. You would think that would be the last thing he would preach about is righteousness, temperance, self-control, and judgment to come. You would think that's the last thing that Paul would preach. Basically, I'd love to sit in on that sermon when he talked about righteousness, living clean, living properly for the Lord. Talk about temperance, not being, you know, indulging yourself in drunkenness and sexual perversion and lust. And he says, you're going to be judged. Felix, you're going to stand before the God who arose again from the dead, Jesus Christ. You're going to be judged. I'd love to have heard that sermon. And the Bible says Felix trembled. He trembled. And not only did he tremble, he says to Paul, I want you to go 
your way, uh, and I'll call you when I have a more convenient season, I'll call for thee. But in Felix's heart, he wanted Paul to give him some money, a bribe, so he could let Paul go, so he could justify letting Paul go if Paul would just give him some money. You say, well, where do you see this? Look at verse 17. He tells Felix in verse 17 of chapter 24, now after many years, Paul said, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Felix is thinking, this guy's got some money. Hello? And so he, he calls Paul in, and he gives Paul an opportunity not to go bail. He gives Paul an opportunity by paying a bribe to let him go. And Paul refused to pay the bribe. How many preachers you know that would do that? Uh, come on, think about it. How many preachers do you know that isn't hung up in the money deal? I'm glad I'm not hung up in the money deal. Our church is too poor to be hung up in the money deal. But anyway, wherefore he sent for him oftener. <laughs> is that a word? Oftener? <laughs> well, it's in the Bible. Felix sent for Paul oftener. Why did he send him for oftener? Because he wanted to talk to Paul and see if Paul could give him some money. But after two years, verse 27, after two years, poor Caius, poor Caius Festus came to Felix's room. That means that, that um, Festus took Felix judgment room, took his office. And Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Now, I'm going to close with this thought. What would you do to get out of a bind? I mean, Paul was arrested. Paul was offered, no doubt, he could get a bribe. How many, how many believe that Paul probably could have sent word to the people in Jerusalem, I need some of that money, and they'd have gave it to him? Or maybe Paul had some of it, I don't know. Maybe he hadn't delivered it all. And yet Paul could have paid the bribe and walked away, but he refused to. And I want you to know that sometimes Christians will do anything to get out of pressure. Sometimes Christians will do anything to get out of a situation that maybe God placed them in. And God placed Paul in the hands of Felix. Honest, he did. And then he gets into the hands of Festus. Festus is another story. And we'll be looking at that next week in the, in the uh, 25th chapter of Festus, who took the place of Felix. And then he goes to a king from there. Festus is, Festus is a piece of work. I mean, he is a piece of work. And, and I want to be honest. Sometimes I feel like I'm a piece of work. Don't say amen right there. Bad place to say it. How many in this room feel like sometimes you're a piece of work? Yeah. Well, I'm glad I'm Jesus' piece of work. I'm glad I'm God's piece of work. Um, Festus was the devil's piece of work. Felix was the greedy, money, 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 politician piece of work. But as a Christian, we're God's piece of work. We are his workmanship. We are God's workmanship. God's making something special out of us. And we should never do something to avoid doing God's will. And we should never pay a price to get out of where God has placed us. And Paul refused to pay the bribe. That's a good lesson. And in the process, he wasn't afraid to tell Felix, hey, you're going to hell. 
Amen? You know, I would advise you, if you get a speeding ticket and you're required to go before the judge, you know, you're going too fast, so you have to appear before the judge. I mean, if it's just a small speeding ticket, something like, you know, uh, 10 miles over the speed limit, you don't have to go see the judge. But if you're going like three times over the speed limit, the, ju- the, 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 the policeman says, well, you're going to have to see the judge or pay a really fancy manure spreader. You're going to have to see the judge. I would advise you if you got a ticket for driving a 100 in a 25, and you got thrown in jail overnight, and you're going to be arraigned before the judge, I would advise you not to walk in there and look at him and say, you're going to hell. Because he's going to say, and you're going to wish you were there when I get done with you. Well, Paul pretty much told Felix, you're going to hell. I'd love to heard the whole sermon, but I think it was probably something like this. You know, Drusilla's really, you know, you, you didn't have temperance there. You, you climbed the ladder of politics wrong. You, you know, you didn't do what was right. He, he said he preached to them righteousness and temperance. You didn't, you didn't use temperance. You lust and you greed and you, you gain for stuff. And then <laughs> that I could just see Paul point at Felix and say, God's going to judge you. Because the Jesus that rose again from the dead is going to call all men to judgment. No wonder Felix trembled. Amen? And if he had responded right then to Jesus Christ, he'd have been saved. But no. He says later, and he gets off away from the presence of Apostle Paul and the moving of the Holy Ghost, and he gets away later, and the conviction, the tremble lifts from him. And now he thinks about money. And he's drawn by lust and money to kind of get Paul to give him a bribe. How many times does that happen? Like, I think it happened this morning. I think there's some people in this church this morning in the sermon that they were trembling. I believe there were some people in this church this morning heard the message and they, they knew they had enough information like Felix did to make a stand, to make a judgment. Enough in, information to make a judgment for Jesus Christ. They trembled and they walked out of here saying, I'll do it later. I'll talk to God when I get home. I'll, I'll talk to God at a later date. I'm not ready yet. Convenient time. And by the time they get out of these doors in their car and drive or right away, that spirit lifts from them. That happens all the time. I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, you can get saved at home. Well, I know you can. Well, you can get saved in your car. I know you can. But bless your heart if God convicts you in church. And you're under deep conviction and God's tugging on your heart. It's a wrong move to get up and walk out of the church because God's calling you there. If you're driving a car and you're under conviction, God's calling you there. If you're at home and you're under conviction, God's calling you there. If you're in church and you're under conviction, God's calling you there. You don't go somewhere and then decide that you'll get right with God some other time because at that moment, God will lift from you. The conviction, the drawing will lift from you and you'll be right back where you were, back in lust, back in desire, back in the hunger for money, back into pleasure, back away from God. And that's a great lesson we can learn. Amen? Hello? This is a poor illustration, but I'm going to, I, I, I got to say, this is a really poor in, uh, illustration. You say, well, preacher, uh, why aren't you, why are you going to share a poor illustration with us tonight? Because I don't know of a poorer one. If you're going to crack an egg and fry it, you better put it in a hot skillet. Because if you wait an hour later and it's not hot and you crack an egg, all you got is a cracked egg and a bunch of grease. 
and it's not going to fry. Told you it was a poor illustration, but I couldn't think of a poor one. Amen? Oh, I don't give you a poor one. I come up with a poor one. I come up with a poor one. You turn the shower on, and you're going to take a shower, and you know that you need to take a shower. You really, really need to take a shower. And you're standing there, and you've got your clothes off, and you think, I've got things to do. And so you put your clothes back on, the shower's still running. To jump inside that shower with your clothes on is a really dumb thing to do. And you're not going to get a shower. You're going to smell like a wet chicken. Told you that's a worse illustration. Amen? I've been around some people today that smells like a wet chicken. But anyway, <laughs> amen. If I ever tell you go jump in the lake, it's probably for a reason. I'm kidding. Come on, give me a break. It's Sunday night. I'm tired. I mean, like this story. This is a fun story. It really is. Easy reading, fun story. When you get home, read this chapter 24 and discover the power of preaching better than your pastor. Just enjoy yourself. Have fun in this chapter. Let it stir your heart. It's an easy read. It's a fun read. Have fun. I've given you enough information about this chapter. You ought to just have a you ought to have a barbecue on this. I mean, you ought to have a joy. You ought to have a buffet in this chapter. The Bible's awesome. Wonderful. Praise God. Stand with me. We're going to give an invitation. Well, we'll, tr we'll try to do better Wednesday night in Zechariah chapter 11. And we'll be in Revelation chapter 8 next Sunday morning. How many enjoyed this morning about the 144,000 witnesses, the Jews, preaching, evangelists? And so we, and I've enjoyed the study through Acts. I've enjoyed this. It's beautiful. And we're going to get into Festus next week. And, and you're going to see he's really a piece of work. And uh, the Lord's going to speak to our hearts. I, I'm sure he spoke to your heart today. And uh, I'm sure that if the Lord's dealing with, you, dealing with you right now about something, then now's the time to move. It's not later. God asks when he wants it done. He doesn't wait later. He, when he asks, he expects a response. Altar's open. You come. Still early. Not even 7 o'clock yet. Still early. You can come and just talk to the Lord. What a beautiful blessing.